today's Pentecost, and so our scripture comes from Acts chapter 2, uh, which records the, the first Pentecost, the birth of the church. Um, and Peter has, uh, uh, well, the Spirit has shown up, and there is this huge commotion taking place, and people have gathered around trying to figure out what's going on, and, and Peter he begins uh, a sermon, uh, and I'm going to jump in on verse 22 as uh, he's preaching his first sermon. So you get to hear his sermon and then mine. You're welcome. <laughs> Here's what Peter says. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken." Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We ask for your Holy Spirit to come and be poured out on us today. Bring this word to life in us. Come, Holy Spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, you know, looking at the condition of the world today, there's not much assurance that good can overcome evil. Good news is hard to find, much less a uh, rock-solid uh, hope that the future will be a good one. I saw a, uh, a news poll that was released uh, this last week that showed that most Americans view a win from either leading uh, presidential candidate in either party uh, as a, na a national disaster. That's exciting to know, right? <laughs> you have the, the media, schools, major corporations continue to push this woke ideology regardless of how much money and trust they lose. We have no control over our national border, and there seems to be no leaders on either side of the aisle that are willing to do anything about it. And this is the crazy one. The, it seems the only way to make sure we don't default on our national debt is to spend more money. Uh, do you have any assurance that good will overcome evil? No. <laughs> the Apostle Peter knows exactly what this feels like. He's about to preach his first sermon, and he can relate to the feeling that darkness has won. Fifty days before he preaches this sermon, uh, he has watched his whole world fall apart. Jesus was betrayed and arrested right before his own eyes. And he swore to Jesus that he would defend him, even die with him if necessary. But he didn't do that. He ends up denying Jesus three times. He locked himself in a room while Jesus was on a cross, hiding, uh, afraid that uh, any moment he could be arrested and put to death as well. He understands despair. And yet here he is 50 days after that. He's in Jerusalem for a feast, uh, the Feast of Pentecost. And Jews from all over the world have gathered for this feast. 
A crowd has gathered around Peter and the other disciples, the other apostles here, because they've heard the sound of this rushing wind. They, they see these flames of fire over, over these folks, and they hear them, men and women from Galilee, declaring the praises of God in their own native tongues from all over the world. And they're wondering, what is going on here? This is crazy. Some people even accuse them of being drunk. And then Peter stands up, and he declares that what they're witnessing is what the prophet Joel spoke about. In the last days, he says, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. That was our affirmation. Peter quotes that passage from the prophet Joel. And then he begins to explain what it all means. He begins by sharing how his hope was decimated. Listen again, verse 22, 23. It says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. Can you hear the hopelessness in Peter's voice? I mean, you can see it, right? Peter here is explaining, Jesus had God's backing. We know this because of all the miracles that he did. You know this because he did those miracles right in front of you, among you. He was the best thing going in this world, and yet you put him to death. Peter's not pulling any punches, is he? You put him to death. In fact, it says, he says it this way, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. Woo! He's not making many friends, is he? It appears, as Peter's talking, that evil had won. And he places the responsibility of Jesus' death squarely on their shoulders. But the same can be true of you and me. In fact, it is. You know, it's because of our sin that Jesus died. It's the condition of our world that crucified him. Um, Peter is preaching to you and me just as much as he was preaching to himself and to the crowd 2,000 years ago. With the help of wicked men, we have nailed hope to a cross. Now, we can lie to ourselves, try and make ourselves feel better by saying, well, I'm making a difference in the world. I'm I'm saving the planet. (laughs) I'm bringing hope and change. Or I'm making America great again. But do you recognize what we have done? We have crucified the best thing to happen to the world since the world began. We did that. But then Peter, he says two of my favorite words in all of Scripture. But God. Oh, those are two great words. Why don't you say them out loud with me? You ready? But God. Yeah, verse 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. (laughs) Folks, we know what we did. And with the help of evil men, we have made a mess of life. Our sin compounds the evil, the wickedness, and despair in the world. But God doesn't let the despair of our own making win. His grace is greater than our sin. And you need to put these words into every circumstance you face. But God. You hear me? But God, I was lost, but God found me. I was sick, but God healed me. I was lonely, but God came looking for me. I was anxious, but God gave me his peace. I was in prison, but God set me free. I was an orphan, but God adopted me. I was ashamed, but God called me by name. I was dead, but God made me alive. You know, none of this was a surprise to God. None of it. You know, we may be shocked as the world around us descends into debauchery at record speeds, but not God. 
He knows the condition of our souls and what it would take to bring salvation to the world. It wasn't an accident. It's not by chance that Jesus died on the cross. You know, we didn't pull a fast one on God and say, ha, ha, look what we pulled off. No. Peter said it this way. He says it was by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. God knew what, would it, what it would take. And the proof that Peter gives is, is in Psalm 16. He quotes David. Because King David saw it coming a thousand years before. In verse 25 and 28, it says, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. David has hope when others have despair. David's not shaken as the events are unfolding around him. He knows the paths of life when others are blazing trails to hell. David is filled with joy while others are filled with anxiety because he sees what God is going to do to right the wrongs in the world. God's Messiah, his Savior, is going to overcome the grave. But how do we know David wasn't talking about himself in this psalm? I mean, you read the psalm, and it sounds like this is David's prayer, you know? My, my tongue rejoices. My, my heart is glad. How do we know we're not, David isn't talking about himself? Well, Peter's glad you asked that question. In verse 29, he says this, Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried, and his tomb is here to this day. Yep, that's true. You can go to Jerusalem today and you can see his sarcophagus. It's shrouded with this you know, big old curtain-looking thing. It's there. I've seen it. Peter goes on, but he was a prophet. And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his, holy, uh, nor did his body see decay. David was letting everyone know how to tell who the Holy One was, who the Messiah was going to be. He was saying, look for the resurrected one. That's him. And so Peter connects the dots for everyone by saying in verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. See, this is not theory. It's not conjecture. It is good news. The resurrection of Jesus is not wishful thinking. It is fact. I love that Peter uses the word fact here because it just drives some people nuts. You can go to Jerusalem today and you can visit the empty tomb of Jesus. I've been there. Empty. You might argue, Mike, it's, it's been 2,000 years now. There are a lot of tombs over there that are empty too. Uh, you, were, you would be right. Absolutely. But the tomb of Jesus has been declared empty since the third day Jesus was put in it. No other person, no other tomb has ever made that claim. The fact is, God raised Jesus to life. And you need to take that fact and you need to place it next to every hopeless fact, every news story, every circumstance you come across. The empty tomb is assurance of a hopeful future for the people of God. But that's not all. No. We might be thinking, well, if that was it, then we just got to wait until we all die and are resurrected and we see Jesus face to face. Then everything gets better. But, uh -uh. No, no, God's not done yet. He's got more in store. God has not only raised Jesus from the dead, but just as important, he has given Jesus all power and authority in heaven and on earth. And remember the, the, the setting here. Everyone has gathered around these apostles uh, trying to figure out what this great commotion of wind and these, these tongues and people speaking their native language. They're trying to figure out what's going on. 
And Peter explains that the Holy Spirit being poured out is evidence that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God. In verse 33, he says, Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. The fact that they're being filled with the Holy Spirit is evidence, you see. Peter explains that he uses Psalm 10 to declare the fact that Jesus is sitting on the throne of heaven. Verse 34 says, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Peter explains that Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on men and women, is evidence of two facts. One, that Jesus has been raised from the dead, and two, that he is seated at the right hand of God with all the power and authority in heaven and on earth. That's what being seated at the right hand of God gets you, by the way. Peter concludes his message this way in verse 36. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. We know what we did. Peter emphasizes it right there. We crucified Him. We crucified Him by our own sin, but we also know what God did. He made Jesus both Lord and Christ by raising Him from the dead and seating Him on the throne of heaven with all power and authority. We have made a mess of the world, but God is restoring it through Jesus Christ. Peter is saying that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on men and women who trust Jesus is evidence of those facts. And those facts have not changed in 2,000 years. But have those facts changed you? That's the question. Do you need assurance that God is on the move, that He is saving, restoring, healing all of creation? Assurance that good will overcome evil. Does your life give evidence that Jesus is alive and Lord of all? God gives us His Holy Spirit to live in us And empower us to give us, to give actually this evidence that Jesus is both Lord and Christ to a world that has gone off the rails. Friends, it used to be that Christians could just coast through uh, our culture without a problem. You know, the cultural norms and values were influenced and reflected Christian values. That is no longer the case. The culture has decided it no longer wants or needs Jesus, the man accredited by God to us by miracles, signs, and wonders. It's rejected Jesus, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who calmed the seas, who fed the hungry, who loved the outcast, who forgave sins and laid down his life as an atoning sacrifice. No, no, we don't need him. It's tried to crucify Jesus all over again. But all of the culture's efforts do not change the facts, and they never will. You can be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. That means the current rulers, the powers the authorities both on earth and in the heavenly realms are not to be regarded as absolute. They no longer have the final word on any subject. They will all answer to Jesus. Even death itself. Every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen? Amen. Amen. (laughs) The scriptures say that when the people heard this from Peter, 
They were cut to the heart. And they asked, well, what, what shall we do? And Peter tells them, he says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. We've made a mess of this world. We've made a mess of our lives and everything else because of our sin. But God's grace is greater than all of our sin. We no longer have to live in fear or darkness. God offers us forgiveness through Jesus Christ to everyone who will believe in Him. And He offers us new life empowered by the Holy Spirit. It's a gift that we get to receive. Now, baptism, baptism is a sacrament. It's a sacred sign by which God gives us grace that that old sinful life is dead and buried and we are raised up to live a new life in Christ. Are you living this new life empowered by the Holy Spirit? I pray that you are. It, it's what you were made for. But many are just kind of halfway there. They like the assurance that their sin is forgiven, but receiving the Holy Spirit and living like Jesus is Lord over everything is not really the boat they want to be in. They have one foot on the dock of this world and one foot on the boat of the Lord. If this is you, then be assured of this. There is no more middle ground The Lord has never liked lukewarm. And now the culture will no longer tolerate it. The time for choosing has come, in or out. The church and culture are no longer headed on parallel paths. This is what the split in the denomination is really all about. It is more necessary now than ever before in our lifetimes that we proclaim and live out our faith. Jesus Christ resurrected and Lord over all. And if you can feel that cut to your heart, then I invite you to repent, to get all in with Jesus and be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's the gift that He's offering today. This afternoon we'll be out at the Gulf participating in in, in the baptism with several other churches. And we have several members who are going to reaffirm their baptism Because they want to be all in. They want to be united with Christ. They want to take the old self and bury it. It's dead and gone. And they want to be raised up. New self. Empowered by the Holy Spirit. And if you'd like to join them, then I invite you to come and see me right after the service. Because I want to pray with you. But be assured of this. The Holy Spirit is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, for anyone who will repent and believe that Jesus is both Lord and Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful that when you step in, And look at the mess that we have made. You redeem us. You don't condemn us. That you gave your one and only Son to bear all of your wrath so that we might be forgiven and made new. And not only that, that now you give us your Holy Spirit. Lord, we receive your Holy Spirit this morning. Come, fill us. We want to live by the two facts of Pentecost, that Jesus is alive and that he's Lord over heaven and earth. Lord, empower us with your Holy Spirit to bear witness to those two facts so that this world that desperately needs to hear good news would receive it. Lord, make this happen, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.